Hello everyone, this is Julie cox Sid, and thank you for joining this week's uh, webinar Wednesday with Dr. Cox and his series of specific condition application of Cox technique. This week we're focusing on degenerative scoliosis. The handouts, which include the guided protocol as well as the slides and references for today, are in the handout panel, so you may download those during today's webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the question box. We will get those at an appropriate time or I'll have those um, asked at the end of today's webinar. Without any other further things to mention, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. James Cox, developer of Cox Technique, as he guides you through the care of degenerative scoliosis. The goal today will be a succinct discussion of the treatment of a challenge to every chiropractic doctor manipulating the human spine, degenerative scoliosis. Um, if you try to lumbar roll these or give them a PA thrust, the chances are it ain't gonna work. So I just ask that you consider, if you see any benefit to our approach of protocol one and protocol two treatment of degenerative spondyl uh, scoliosis. The first two pages <clears throat> are the outline of the protocols, the tolerance testing, the three forms of care, which you will be shown of prone, supine, and sideline technique. Again, I will share with you the use of two to four to six pounds of distractive force in treating these patients. We will also discuss the meta exercise for same. Again, <clears throat> I like to open with some powerful papers as to why we practice this technique. The, the Palmer College, did this study published in Evidence-Based Complementary Alternative Medicine about the forces used and the changes that take place in the release of pain in the adult rat. And in this study, and it was published here, and you can look the paper up uh, on your own, it is the anti-nociceptive effect of spinal manipulative therapy, specifically Cox Technique. And in this study, we were studying both the human and the Worcester rat. To do this study, we used a table one twelfth the size of the Cox 8 instrument. It was built and designed at the University of Iowa under the direction of Dr. Ram Gudavali and myself. And we test these big Worcester rats on the treatment of low velocity, variable amplitude, Cox manipulation. That is the term, as opposed to high velocity, variable amplitude, we are using a low velocity, varying amplitude of manipulation in the treatment of all spinal conditions. There are many people who will not tolerate lumbar rolls, PA thrusts, and I think you're going to agree when we look at this condition that this technique may add something to your clinical prowess in the treatment of a very difficult condition. This paper by Chow, published in Musculoskeletal Science Practice, concludes that a horizontal distraction increases disc space height. We utilize this premise in Cox flexion distraction manipulation in that when we first distract a segment and its adjacent segments, that we are reducing the stenotic effect of disc degeneration, disc herniation, ligamentum flavum thickening, faucet arthrosis, and end plate hypertrophy. We want to reduce the stenotic factor before we place a faucet joint into its physiological ranges of motion. So that leads us to the work of Jun, published here in March of last year in Chiropractic Manual Therapy on the potential mechanisms for lumbar spine stenosis change following spine manipulative therapy. This paper showed six things that happen when we do spine manipulation. We change muscle activity, we increase range of motion, decrease pain, lower the pain threshold. We 
change the spinal tissue behavior, the myofascial changes, and we also have autonomic nervous system changes of afferentation. Consider also the reach of Gudavali Cox Cruz Olding and Yoakum at the Loyola Med School, Heinz VA Hospital, in collaboration with National and Palmer Universities, when we showed five things that happen when you perform the type of manipulation we will do together here shortly. Number one, we increase disc space height. We drop intradiscal pressures up to a negative 190 millimeters of mercury in a lumbar spine and 510 in a cervical spine. We increase foramilaria by 28%. We restore and increase physiological range of motion and we create afferentation. That is the normal excitatory impulses via the lateral spinal thalamic tracts, the tracts of gall and burdock for proprioception to the somatosensory cortex of the brain create the efferent corticospinal tracts that carry endorphins to the area of pain. Looked at another way, these are the spine changes that are known to need to take place if a patient has a positive outcome in pain and disability following a single spine manipulation. Wong said we must increase range of motion. Two, we must strengthen muscles. We must increase the imbibition of fluids through the end plate from the vertebral cancellous bone into the nucleus pulposus of the disc. And as Kuo pointed out, a very important factor, distraction treatment is effective in enhancing the nutrition supply to the disc, and in his words, promoting disc cell proliferation of degenerated discs. That's why we give people chondroitin and glucosamine sulfate in discat enhanced, along with the five minerals found in the intervertebral disc itself. These create synthesis of glycosaminoglycan, that chemical that creates the turgor within the disc itself. And then Chung, published in Radiology, who showed that when we use distraction, we separate the disc space, we change the disc shape, we reduce the intervertebral disc herniation, we separate the disc and open the opening for the, for the nerve roots, and we widen the facet joint space. So when we move to clinical rounds, therefore, and you've seen this patient, you see them every day. Am I right? Degenerative scoliosis. In my clinical practice, if I tried to lumbar roll this patient, it was met with great resistance. And if I tried to force this curve, it not only was resistance, it created iatrogenesis. So I would ask you, when we look at this on the AP, these marked degenerative changes on the sagittal, degenerative changes here, a less severe scoliosis. I would ask you to consider, is this technique what you're about to witness? Would it be a benefit to your patients? Or better yet, how would you address this patient? Let's go to the instrument and briefly and succinctly offer to you the treatment that we would use in treating these curves and realize our main treatment is into the convexity of the curve to straighten, create range of motion, increase foramenal area, increase facet range of motion. Let's go to the instrument how we do this. In treating, for example, a dextrorotatory thoracolumbar scoliosis with degenerative change. The concave side filled with osteophytic spurs, sometimes even with ankylosis. The convex side, the widening disc space. The weakness of the quadratus lumborum on the convexity of the curve. When we treat, we will have the tiller bar. We will begin manually. We will release the flexion extension, manual distraction. I will come well above the curve. If it's, say, a curve extending from T10 to the sacrum, I'll move up into the lower thoracic spine, say, into the T8 area, and just apply flexion distraction. 
And I'd like you to note the force I'm using at two pounds. I'm going here from four to six pounds. And I say to the patient as I move down from that upper thoracic above the scoliotic curve and move through the curve, I say, does this cause you any discomfort? Are you okay with this? And I'll move all the way down to S1. Carefully tolerance testing at about two pounds of force. Then, what do people often know, Doc? It just feels good. Very rare do you get people who say it hurts if you use two pounds of force. Then I move back up to the top. And I'm going to release my lateral flexion lever. I'm going to distract from well above that curve. And as I move down, I'm going to begin to distract. And then in a coupled movement, apply distraction and circumduction, a combination of flexion and lateral flexion in a smooth, rhythmical, coupled movement into the convexity of the curve. In this case, with a right thoracolumbar, lumbar, distracting and circumducting into the right side, the side of convexity of the scoliotic curve. Now, I can also do this. I can make a contact well above, distract until I feel good tautness of the spine, and then apply circumduction under distraction into the convexity of that curve. I will then do one of two ways with these curves. After I've carefully tolerance tested, the patient tolerance tests and withstands this quite well, I begin to utilize long y-axis automated distraction. It's good because it gives you the same consistent force each time. If you will watch the screen, you'll note that I use much less force because it's, it's quite a bit stronger distraction when I utilize automated distraction. So here I start, and you'll note I'm using, as I distract the entire curve, starting above the curve down, I'm utilizing here about 9 to 10 pounds of distractive force. But I'd ask you to note, I'm applying that over a total column of thoracolumbar spine. When you re realize the work that has been done on what gives the best result, 10 or 50% of body weight, you saw that 10% of body weight gave the better clinical outcome. So we will use this distraction. You see how smooth and rhythmical it is? The light blue line and the dark blue line almost parallel one another. The dark blue line meaning my cephalward force, the dark blue line the distraction force I'm applying at each segment. That's how you want it to look when you use long y-axis after careful tolerance testing with manual therapy. The use of long y-axis distraction. So we combine distraction with lateral flexion in the patient prone. Now, I'd like to show you that in some of these cases you will get your best results in some patients side line. So Mike, you'll turn facing me, lying on your side. Now I want your pelvis to come down here. That's good. Now that's fine. Then you bring the tiller bar up. Let their legs rest comfortably against it. I also will raise the instrument so that I don't have to hurt my back treating them. This technique, my colleague, is a wonderful way to treat degenerative scoliosis. You're carefully tolerance testing, you're carefully controlling the force, you will bring your arm through the patient, you will release the flexion lever of the instrument, and I will grasp between the spinous and the transverse process with my fingers 
and laterally flex to reduce the convexity of the curve. I asked the patient, are you okay with that? Does that cause you any pain? And you'll notice the force I'm using is about three pounds per segment. When they feel no discomfort, in fact say no, it feels good, then add long y-axis distraction. And note how the force increases. I'm going here almost 14 pounds of distraction utilizing long y-axis distraction and lateral flexion into the convexity of this right thoracolumbar curve. Now, if I release my lateral flexion lever in treating scoliosis, I can perform the most powerful movement that I can place a triple joint complex in called circumduction. Please note, distract, flex, laterally flex each of these segments, asking the patient, are you okay? Does this cause you any discomfort? Do you see it? This is a beautiful technique, well tolerated, good pain relief for a patient with degenerative scoliosis. Incidentally, what is good relief? It's 30% relief. You don't get 100% relief with these patients. 30% relief is considered a good clinical outcome, meaning that it was worth using the technique in treating that patient. Now, I'm going to lock this instrument. Small movements, lower the tiller bar. And I'd like to share with you a technique that will become very commonplace for you in treating degenerative scoliosis in middle age and older people, people with Kumbel's disease, old osteoporotic post endocrinopathy compression fractures osteoporosis, frail, more gently requiring patients with spinal manipulation. You will use this with great relief and no adverse side, or minimal chances. I've never had any adverse side effects, but please note how we do this with the patient supine. Fly on your back, Michael, please. Again, I want the pelvis down here, bring the feet up, Bring up my tiller bar. The patient's pelvis is on the caudal section. Have them cross their hands for your contact. And this is a dextro-rotatory curve. So release the lateral flexion lever and just begin testing how well they tolerate lateral flexion into the convexity of the curve. I say to them, are you okay with that? Does that cause you any discomfort at all? And when they say no, I will then begin to apply long y-axis distraction and lateral flexion into the convexity of that curve. And you'll note that here I'm using on the entire thoracolumbar curve, about seven to eight pounds of force, as measured on the force table. You can see the movement, you can see the sine wave and the force application. And as the patient improves and I can increase that range of motion, I'll release the flexion lever and apply even greater distraction force, namely circumduction, which is long y-axis distraction and lateral flexion and a coupled movement into the convexity of that curve. And you'll note here that I'm using about 10 pounds of distraction force. This is very gentle. It's a gentle form of care that patients respond well to without creating any iatrogenesis. Now let's say
that this patient also had some thoracolumbar fractures. In that case, you will hold and do this manually. You will place the fracture at the lower end of the thoracic piece and just extend into the compression area very gently saying, does this cause you any pain? And you can also add a bit of long y-axis, carefully asking the patient, are you okay with this? Any adverse effects at all? Now, Frank, I want you to turn my on your tummy again. I'd like to share with you the meta exercise. A dextro-rotatory curve, weakness of the quadratus lumborum. You want to strengthen the quadratus lumborum on the convex side of a curve, because as you strengthen it, it will force the curve to straighten. You can do it a couple of different ways. You can, at home, you can have someone hold the patient's ankle and teach the patient to Tighten the quadratus as if they're lifting the pelvis to the rib. Tighten that muscle, right? Relax. And as they do that, you can see the convexity of the curve flatten. Do it again, Michael. Now, in order to enhance that, in clinic, you can put the cuff on the ankle. Place a cuff on the patient's ankle and have them Tighten against that. Now tighten again. So he's got a resistance and relax and just keep tightening. And we teach people to do this 25 times in clinic and once a day at home. At home, in order to enhance it, you can ask someone to just stand and hold their leg. Now tighten leg and perform it slowly and rhythmically 25 times to strengthen the quadratus lumborum muscle to bring that curve into a vertical posture. So we have discussed the very basics of the treatment of degenerative scoliosis, a challenge, one which you, I could never be too forceful with without creating pain for my patient the smooth, rhythmical, oscillatory movement of spine mobilization with Cox Technique will give the relief without iatrogenesis. Two things, those of you who think that this may be a benefit to you, I would urge you to study for certification with me and our other five instructors through National University of Health Sciences to learn this. Julie can tell you about how to sign up for those certification courses. The other thing is, if you're ever interested in studying with me one-on-one, -on -one, contact me about that. I hope that this has been beneficial. That ends my treatise today on degenerative scoliosis. And want you to know the rest of our schedule here. The next webinar Wednesdays conditions will be March 17th, lumbar spine spondylosis, April 7, lumbar spine intervertebral disc herniation, and April 21, cervical spine intervertebral disc herniation. You can sign up at coxtechnique.com for those. If you're more interested in degenerative and idiopathic scoliosis and care, he's done a couple series on there online for CE credits. Also check out the textbook. There are several sections and chapters on scoliosis in the low back textbook. We do have workshops that are live in certified doctor's offices uh, from Australia to Indiana to kind of everywhere in the US. So check those out. Online CE, um, we have a, a lot of those, about 168 hours up there now. And live seminars, we are doing those. We hope to see you, especially for the new part four thoracic spine here in April. Coming up April 17, 18, we'll do our part one and two lumbar spine, the end of April, and our new part five extremity sport and rehab in September. So we have some new things we've been developing. Um, even though COVID happened, we're still pushing forward. So, um, and then please check out the COX-8 force table by Haven Medical. Their engineers have followed what we needed in training 
And now many doctors are finding that the force table really works in their office as they are helping patients visualize what's going on in their spine, give Amanda a call for more information. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Those are all the ways you can get in touch with us. If you're interested in DISCAT, you can go to coxtrc.com. Um, if you're interested in our seminars, Cox Technique, uh, the Cox Table, Cox Technique Complete, everything is there. So thank you for joining us today. Otherwise, we'll see you at the next webinar. Have a wonderful afternoon. We're certain that you'll see some of these degenerative scoliosis cases. So thank you very much.